This is the third of four sermons as we work through the life of Jonah. There's four chapters to the book, so we're taking one chapter each week going through it. We're at chapter three this week. Chapter one, we saw Jonah was the runaway. God told him to do something that he didn't care to do, and that was go preach to his enemies over in Nineveh. He didn't want to go do that. He was a popular prophet right there in Israel. He was telling them all the good things, the way that God was going to bless them. And he liked his job the way it was. But God gave him a new task, and he said, nope, I'm not going to do it. So he jumps on a boat, goes the opposite direction, but God gets his attention and says, hey, I'm not done with you yet. You're the runaway, but um, in the midst of the process, Jonah goes overboard. The great fish sent from God came alongside, swallowed him whole. While he was inside the stomach of the whale, he realized that what he had done was wrong, that he was repentant in the fact that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And last week, we kind of picked on Jonah a little bit. Even though he was sorry that he didn't do what he was supposed to do, he wasn't ready to actually change it totally. He didn't say, okay, I've done what's wrong. Okay, I'm ready to go to Nineveh now. No, he just said, I want to go back to the temple and offer up sacrifices. He wasn't thinking about following God the whole way. It's kind of like if we are going through life and we need to repent of some sin and we're moving this direction and God wants us to be going the other direction. But we look back and we see that direction, but we still keep going the way that we want to go. God's saying, no, that's not repentance. Repentance is when we turn around and we go the way that God has called us to go. And so we took a look at that last Sunday of being able to see how repentance started but didn't quite get there. And we'll see it working its way through. Um, so anyway, so we're, we pick up today where Jonah had been spit out of the whale. Interesting, he wasn't spit out in the midst of the water again. He was spit out onto dry land. So that fish was able to get up close enough to the shore where he was spit out. And he was able to continue on. So we read today what happens further. And as we've been doing the last couple of weeks, let's stand and let's read chapter 3. I will read one verse and then you'll read the next verse that's bolded either in your bulletin or on the screen. So let's read chapter 3 of Jonah. It begins like this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying... So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Who knows? God may turn and relent. And turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Thank you. Please be seated. Nineveh is located in what is now northern Iraq. It was the royal city, the capital city of the great Assyrian Empire, and this takes place about 700 B.C., and they've done lots of archaeological research of this area, and it indeed was a great city. And they've actually found so many artifacts that show us that what happened here in the book of Jonah, that we read the Bible, are actually true. There's a whole section of the city that got renamed. It was called Nebayunas, which means the prophet Jonah. They even named a part of the city after him, after he was there. 
I mean, and there's all kinds of, of um, things there that show that there was a generation of, of Assyrians who turned from their pagan ways and began to worship the God, the God of the Hebrews, the one true God that we worship here today. Now, eventually, they went back to worshiping their pagan gods again, but there was a generation that they can see in the archaeological finds that show that this very story is true. We also learned last week another reason why we know this story is true is because Jesus said, hey, remember how Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days? That's going to be like me when I die. I'm going to be in the grave for three days. And if Jesus lies to us, then, um, then we don't have to believe the story of Jonah. But if Jesus could only tell the truth, then he also affirmed that this story is true. So Jesus has showed the story is true. Archaeology shows us the story is true. And um, if we look at the, some of the slides here that show just the, the archaeological finds, you can see that they've been able to restore a lot of the, the walls, the gates, um, a lot of the buildings that are in there. There should be three slides that show that. And then you go on to the fourth slide. And the fourth slide up here is kind of an artist recon you know, a, a kind of saying, drawing what the city might have looked like. Um, it was a very large city. We, it's, it's really hard to tell how large the city was, um, even with all the archaeological findings that are there, um, because it seemed to just spread on for, for miles and miles and miles. And the Bible tells us that it was a three-day journey around the city. And Bible translators aren't sure if that means it took three days to walk around the city on the, on the circumference of it. Um, and if that's the case, um, a day's journey was considered 20 miles that you could walk. So it could be 60-mile circumference of the city, possibly. It could mean that a three-day journey was to get in and throughout the whole city would take three days. It would take 60 miles worth of walking just to go back and forth up and down the streets to be able to visit the whole city. We're not sure if it means that as well. Or it could just mean that there was just an expression. A three-day journey just meant it was big, you know, and maybe it was just big. And so different commentaries I read were all all had different things to say about this, but we know it was a very large city. History, archaeology, and the Bible tell us that it was a great city. In fact, is in all of history, the two greatest fortified cities that have ever existed has been Babylon and Nineveh. During the Babylonian Empire, the city of Babylon had great walls. It was very fortified. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and it was fortified well um, also. In fact, as this was such a large city, the walls around it were huge. There were big towers around it. I mean, if anybody wanted to come and attack this place, they didn't have a chance. And then here, what we have is this foreigner, Jonah, walks into the city. And what's he say? In 40 days, your city is going to be destroyed. <laughs> like, really? Like, who's going to destroy this big city? Nobody could do it. These people were very proud of themselves for their empire that they had it built. They felt safe. They felt secure. They had their idols that they thought protected them. They were very immoral people. Why would they even listen to somebody like Jonah that walks into town and says, In 40 days, your city is going to be destroyed. Repent and turn to God. Ha. Huh. Well... It could have been that the people would have just laughed at him, thrown him out of the city. They could have just arrested him for trying to disturb the peace. They could have just said, okay, if it's going to happen in 40 days, let's just eat, drink, and be merry and have it be over with. But what happened? The city did what? They heard these words and they repented. I mean, totally, like, shocked. Like, why would these people listen to him? And receive his words and actually repent and turn from their idolatry and turn to the one true God and repent of their sins. As we read here, to repent of the violence that was in their hands. These were violent people that were into beating up everybody and killing each other. I mean, there was, there was a lot of bad stuff going there. This is a city of probably at least a half a million people, if not a million people. And we read that as he went through and he exclaimed the word of God, that somehow God moved in their hearts. And a great revival came to the people from the lowest up to the king. 
It's amazing. We think that the big story of Jonah is that he got swallowed by a fish and lived to tell about it. This is the big miracle of the book of Jonah. A city of maybe a million people hear the word of God and they all repent. Imagine just even going out to our little town or the towns around us. If we went out and preached and everybody said, yes, we're going to give our hearts totally to God. I mean, we would just be blown away, wouldn't we? Of just maybe a few thousand people, let alone hundreds of thousands. It would be great to go out and have one person <laughs> repent. I mean, that would make my day if just one person turned to God. But here we got Jonah. The God went before him and worked in the hearts of people, and they accepted his words as the words of the Lord. These were the enemies of God. These were the enemies of Israel and Israel's God, but yet they embraced it. They embraced the truth that was there. And we see that in Jonah's ministry, he gets on a ship with all these pagan sailors, and they end up becoming worshipers of God. And now he goes to the city of Nineveh with all these pagan people, and they become worshipers of God. I mean, he's having a pretty, pretty successful uh, ministry here, it looks like. So here, all the pagans are repenting. But back in Israel, where Jonah's from, the people of God are not repenting. How do you think that Jonah's feeling about that? Well, God's blessing all these other people, but what about us? Why aren't we turning to God? How can God change his mind? It says that God changed his mind here. We actually read in Jeremiah, another prophet, in chapter 18, 7 to 10. He said, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation, concerning which I have spoken of, turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I'm intending to do to it. And at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. And it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. I mean, God has plans to either bless or to bring cursing, curses and punishment. But if the people respond one way or another, then he'll change his course of action. We have a God who's got order and he's got plans, but he's also a God that, that responds to how we respond to him as well. And as we respond to him, he brings blessings. When we turn away from God, it brings the curses. And so God has a right to be able to work in a way that will accomplish his purposes. And he does that even following how we respond to him. God doesn't delight in destruction. We're told in the book of Ezekiel, God doesn't want to punish. He doesn't want to bring curses. It hurts him. It grieves him to do so. But, but that's a natural consequence of turning away from God. And in his justice and righteousness, he has to put his foot down. God is a God of judgment, but he's also a God of mercy. And back in the beginning of Genesis, when God called Abraham and said, I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bless you so that you can be what? A blessing to the whole world. God didn't raise up Israel just to be the favored people and everybody else can just go to hell. He said, no, I want to use you, Israel, as a tool so that no one has to go to hell. So that everybody can know the love and grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Israel, during this era, was used as a tool to reach the nations as well. And God is just doing here through Jonah what he promised to do way back when. And God looked at the city of Nineveh, as evil as it was, and had compassion and said, Here's a people that will repent, and I want to be able to show them my mercy. And since then, God has told us. We are not Israel, but we are the new Israel. We are brought into his family and says, you are my witnesses of the grace of God. So go near and far and let the world know about me. And we're given that very same job that Jonah had. We live in a world full of pagans. We live with a lot of people that need the Lord. And we have the opportunity to walk in. And we may say, this person would never repent. <laughs> You know, I can't ever imagine that person standing in church singing songs to God. I mean, you know some people like that, right? 
it can happen. If God can change the hearts of the Ninevites, he can change that person that popped into your mind just now. There are 24,000 people groups in the world. That's people groups that have a similar culture and language that bind them together. And out of those 24,000, there are 12,000 of those. Half of them either have no access to the gospel of Jesus or very limited access. There are still about 3 billion people in the world who have very limited, if not no, connection with a Christian, with a church, with a Bible, with the word of Jesus. And so we still have a lot of work to do in this world. And just because we think, oh, everybody around us has heard about it, that's not true. There are so many people right here in this town, I can tell you, that have no clue about Jesus. As part of a class I was taking on evangelism, I had to go out to the park and do some surveys and ask people questions about what they believed. I would meet people that had even no idea what Easter was about right in our cola. They had no clue. And you go, how could that be? But it's true. There are people here that have no clue what Jesus, who he is and what he did. They've heard his name. They know he has something to do with religion and these church buildings, but they don't have a clue. Sometimes I do funerals for people who have no church affiliation at all. And I talk to their families and say, well, it, did, the, did the person have like uh, a favorite hymn or a Bible verse or a Bible story? And they'll say, we don't, we don't, we don't even have a Bible in our house. The person has never been to church their whole life. I mean, there are people right here that have never even stepped foot in a place like this their whole life. They've never had a Bible. No one's told them a Bible story. Anything they know about God, they picked up just through culture. So the pagans aren't always way out there. They're right here as well. And if we keep our eyes and ears open, we'll find them next door to us as well. Um, that's one reason why we started this evangelism committee. You know, and we've got some people studying about evangelism. How do we as a church reach out to the people around us? And we're, we're working on that as a church. We're not a church that just says, come in here, but we're a church that says, how can we go out there and make a difference? And we're working on those things. And you're a part of that. It's already happening and going to keep happening as we go out there to our world. We have a committee that's working on missions, foreign missions. And we've already been collecting some money for a couple different projects. We're focused, working in Africa uh, with the House of Hope, um, Legacy of Hope, working in the... Um, in, in Honduras with orphans. Those are just a couple things. We're, we're doing a little bit, but we can do more as we grow and as we, our vision for the world becomes big, that we can make a difference. Just like Jonah made there in Nineveh. There's some special circumstances that came up with Jonah and his ministry. And when you hear this stuff, it blows you away how God was working. Does anybody have an idea what the word Nineveh means? course you wouldn't but it means the place of the fish kind of a connection there isn't it the place of the fish and the main god that they worshiped was a god whose name was dagon he was the god of the fish the god of the river the city Nineveh was along the tigris river i mean this is desert here we're talking about iraq okay but along the river a main source of their food was the fish in the river. And so they had a god, Dagon, of the fish that they would pray to that keep that fish going in that river there so we can catch it and have something to eat. The god Dagon was actually a merman. He was half man and half, half fish. So here comes Jonah, who had been what? Swallowed by a fish and lived to tell about it. God had prepared the circumstances of Jonah's life so that there could be what we call a radical identification. They could accept him because there was something about him that they could connect with. They loved their fish and they loved their fish God. And here was a prophet from another country. Somehow, I guess, I don't know if there were witnesses to Jonah's exit from the fish. Maybe when he was spit out on dry land, it was along a beach or something. There were people there that saw this. We don't know exactly what happened. We do know that if he was swallowed by a fish, that his skin was probably bleached white from the stomach acids. We know that all his hair would have been digested off of his body already. We know that he would probably, as many baths as he took, he would probably smell 
like the inside of a fish. So there might have been some physical marks on his body that showed that he wasn't just a guy from Israel coming over there, but he had been through something. But no matter what the circumstances, we don't know all of them. We know that God prepared Jonah, even through this disobedience, to be able to have something on his record, a part of who he was, that made him just the right person to go talk to these Ninevites. Isn't that cool? I just think that's just amazing that this story has that backstory to it that makes it come together. And we have some sort of radical identification as well with the people around us that don't know God. There's some way that we can connect with them. We may feel like we're totally different than they are because we're Christians and we don't do what they do. We go to church on Sunday or they sleep in or play baseball or mow their yard. I mean, we feel like we're so different from they are, but let's find what we have in common. We're humans. Find what we have in common with the people who don't know Christ. Start there. And as they begin to see what we have in common, they'll start to see what we have different in each other. And that will bring up opportunities to be able to share the truth about Jesus Christ. We don't just go up to people and start preaching to them and tell them all the verses of the Bible. We've got we to we cultivate the soil of their hearts. Some people have already been cultivated and they're ready to receive it. But most people out there, you've still got some work to do. We love on them, we serve them, we show them the gospel in our lives so that when the time comes, we can share with them to speak about what it means. And that's what we're doing. We're talking about this year. We live it, we show it, and we speak it. And Jonah has such a great story that shows how he did all three together. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 38, he says, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. To send out laborers into his harvest. That's my prayer. That should be our prayer for one another. That we would be praying for each other. That we would be workers in the harvest. That as we go through our day-to-day -day life at school, at work, with our neighbors, with our clubs, with the different things that we do. That we would rub shoulders with people and be able to live it and show it and speak it to the people around us. We pray for each other. That we would be those laborers in the harvest field. So that more and more people could be able to know the love of God. Jesus took a big step in radical identification with us. Just think about it. The Son of God did what? He became what? Human. He became something that we can understand. A spirit up in heaven, that, that's hard for us to grasp. But as soon as that spirit up in heaven, the Son of God, took on a human body, lived as a baby, and grew, went through adolescence, became a young man, he worked, he talked, he ate, he did everything we do, he suffered physically on a cross, we can kind of relate to that. And with that radical identification that Jesus made for us, it helps us understand the way of who God is. And um, such a beautiful story. Next week, we're going to see that Jonah is still going to have some issues to work through related to his mission that he had. But God continues to work on him just as he works with us.